Parasitic plants. These are some of the most interesting plants out there, and uh, they are tapping the potential of their fellow plants to um, get by in life. They are, in other words, living by stealing. Uh, in general, they're flowering plants covering 19 families, uh, so you know, really a wide range of uh, taxonomic um, categories, and estimated to be as many as 4,100 species of plants are actually parasitic. Uh, they're not all exactly the same in their parasitism. Some are called obligate parasites, which means they have to parasitize in order to complete their life cycle. And some are facultative. They can live without the host or they uh, have some capability of photosynthesis. They just uh, take a little extra juice out of their hosts. They parasize the roots or the stems. There's a variety of different ways they get into plants. Um, some are completely without chlorophyll and some are partial. Obviously, the obligate ones are going to be uh, without chlorophyll and um, the facultative, are going, facultative uh, parasites will have partial uh, chlorophyll uh, photosynthetic abilities. Uh, they usually use a modified root called a hostorium that penetrates into the xylem or the phloem or both. Some are very host specific and some uh, pretty much find whatever plant uh, they can get to and uh, uh, parasitize. They also sometimes transmit diseases. Bacterial and um, uh, viral diseases can be transmitted by these uh, plants. And uh, they, in some cases, cause significant economic damage to crops. They can uh, really spread pretty wildly and uh, actually stress the plants enough that they uh, can kill them or at least uh, greatly reduce their ability to fruit and grow. This is a cross-section of a, uh, a microscope slide, a cross-section of a, um, a hostorial root going into the vascular tissue of the uh, host plant. So you can see down here, this is the vascular bundle, that this little blobby thing up here is the root, and it has uh, sent down tissue into this plant and then is uh, tapping into that um, xylem and phloem to get its nutrients. Sort of creepy. Examples of parasitic plants, mistletoe, who thought? Uh, many, many different families, so there's a lot of different things uh, called mistletoe. There's another one called dotter or witch's broom, which uh, you may have seen and not realized was a plant. It looks like orange silly string um, sprayed all over its host. A very beautiful species called Indian paintbrush, Castilea, um, is partially parasitic. Indian pipe is a really unusual looking little thing, is an um, obligate parasite. And we already talked about Rafflesia, the um, uh, grape family member that has the largest flower, is parasitic. And in Australia, there's a thing called Christmas tree that is um, uh, parasitic all over the place down there. So here's Dodder. And uh, that's the one I mentioned. Looks like silly string got sprayed all over a plant. This one is parasitizing elderberry. These big uh, wider leaves are the host plant. The orange strings is the Dodder. The little bitty white flowers are the flowers on dotter, not these uh, daisy fleabane flowers that are in the lower right of the picture. Here is a, 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 a closer photograph of the actual flowers. These are um, angiosperms. They produce pollen and stigma style ovary, stamens, anthers, the, the whole bit. This uh, again is dotter, also called witch's broom. There is an interesting article about uh, this genus in your textbook on page 4, figure E1.1. There are many, many different species, and they attack different hosts with different degrees of specificity. But as far as economic um, species that they um, attack, uh, citrus really has some problems, tomatoes, beets, petunias, uh, alfalfa, clover, roses, a lot of different um, uh, plants that um, people try to grow in large quantities for the purposes of uh, economic benefit. And uh, as I said before, the, you can get enough of a load, uh, stress of uh, dotter on these species that it causes uh, the plants to not grow or even die. The um, problem, one problem with dotter is it's very difficult to get rid of. Nothing short of hand pulling them off and burning all those uh, uh, tissues will cure. And even leaving tiny little bits behind, they will just simply regrow. Uh, those tendrils twine around, and when they find them, uh, stomata or a lenticel in uh, uh, the host plant, in they go and the whole thing just starts all over again. Uh, additionally, they produce thousands of seeds and per plant, uh, per flower, and uh, they are viable, the seed is viable for over 60 years. So you can have an infestation that seems to be sort of under control and in the right conditions cause those seeds to germinate and, and there you are back. 
So you'd think they would take over the universe, uh, but they don't because they are somewhat host specific. They don't attack every plant. And, um, and the good news is they also attack kudzu, which is a very nasty um, invasive species down in uh, our southern states. It um, uh, doesn't take frost, so we don't have too much problem with it up here, but uh, down south it's a terrible problem. And uh, happily enough, the um, uh, daughter sometimes does help cut that back. Here's a really interesting, uh, unusual looking one called Indian pipe. This is an obligate uh, uh, parasite. You can see how white it is. There's uh, no chlorophyll at all. You can see the flowers in the lower left. Uh, again, this is an angiosperm. This is in the heather family. You know, as in heather, the beautiful purple flowers that grow on the, the heaths. It's pretty widely um, around the world. And it's unusual in that it uses a fungus to attack, the, to be the sort of the transport for the nutrients. Many, many, many trees uh, have a, um, fungi in their roots that are actually symbiotic. They help the tree. But uh, this guy, and we will talk about those uh, in a future date. They're called mycorrhizae. Um, these, this species of plant has figured out how to use the, the fung fungi to send nutrients to it. Mistletoe is parasitic with the uh, interesting derivation of the name of dung on a twig. It turns out that um, uh, Anglo-Saxon for dung was uh, mistle, mistle, and tan uh, meant twig. And these uh, species spread by uh, birds eat their fleshy fruit and then they um, process that seed and deposit it on other trees and the seed germinates there because it's very sticky. So uh, the, the bird droppings sort of help glue it to the a host, and then uh, we're off again with another infestation. The Navajo called them basket on high, which I think is a little more appealing, but they are much more commonly known as mistletoe. They're he hemiparasitic. You can see in the photograph there, they have a kind of an off green color. They don't look like a healthy uh, bright green photosynthetic plant, but they can uh, uh, do some photosynthesis on their own. And in particular, when they're young, before they've established a, a good connection to the host, they can photosynthesize. And um, uh, they generally take, because they are somewhat photosynthetic, they take mostly water and minerals from the host, so they would be tapping into the xylem more than the phloem. There are many, many species, genera, families, uh, sort of all over the place. Uh, I'd predict in another five or ten years there will probably be many more species once uh, people get a little better uh, look at the um, genetic relationships of all these different um, types of mistletoe. And actually they were, you know, for many years considered to be uh, negative, that they were killing things and they're parasitic. And in later years they've come full circle to be recognized as keystone species. They're widely used by birds for nesting and food and uh, provide a lot of uh, food in the winter for animals and um, in general are uh, much more um, important in knitting an ecosystem together and helping um, support diversity than in causing problems. Many are actually poisonous in spite of the fact that they're uh, still sold for Christmas decorations because of the mythology of uh, kissing under the Christmas uh, under the mistletoe. Most of them are tropical, subtropical, and don't like real cold weather, although there are some that uh, grow in very cold climates. And uh, they have a wide range of hosts, as you can imagine, with there's so many different species, there are going to be a lot of different trees that are um, attacked by these. Uh, Indian paintbrush is a beautiful species, Castilea. There's uh, many different species. By the way, when there's SPP listed, uh, that means many species. SP dot is one species, and SPP means several. In this case, over 200 in the uh, order Lamiales, family Orobanchaceae, and um, very, very common in the Rocky Mountains, uh, Western America, uh, Alaska, all the way down into South America. These are hemiparasites. They have some uh, photosynthetic ability. They uh, also are um, on a wide range of hosts. It's hard to even know what their host is since they are root parasites. And um, uh, you've got to dig everything up before you can find out who's attached to what. So um, hard to know, and they are somewhat generalists. Interestingly, they tend to concentrate selenium, which in the poorly developed soils of the Rockies uh, can be in high concentrations, which can lead to toxicity. However, the native people um, did actually eat them like a salad, sort of, uh, the flowers. And uh, they even made a hair wash to make their hair glossy, which uh, modern-day people think probably came from the, the amount of selenium that was in the leaves. 
you wonder how long it took them to figure um, this type of thing out. Here's some photographs of Indian paintbrush taken in uh, Glacier National Park. There um, are about seven species at Glacier. One of them is yellow. And there probably are three species represented on this page. Those two orange ones are um, uh, probably different. One of them is a lot hairier than the other, and then that beautiful pink one. Um, and the plant plants are growing near. You know, obviously some of those are being parasitized, but uh, hard to say which. The actual leaves of the um, Castilea are the little narrow things uh, in the foreground in the picture of the pink one. And um, uh, the leafy, ferny thing in the back is uh, probably what they're parasitizing. And finally, we've already seen this one before, the corpse flower. Herflesia arnoldii is this one. This is the largest single flower in the world, and it's kind of interesting to think this is a complete parasite. Apparently, it doesn't even emerge from the vines that it um, parasitizes until it blooms, and then it puts out this massive, huge flower, which I suppose if, you know, thinking, which you're not supposed to say, but um, uh, thinking like a plant, uh, if you're not concerned about producing your uh, own photosynthate to use for growth, then you know why do you care how, how um, efficient you are? And so what the heck, let's grow the biggest flower in the world. We're not the ones producing the, the sugars to make it. And um, so it finally emerges from this vine, puts out this massive, huge flower. It only lasts a few days, and uh, then they're done. And I think I can click on here and show you. Here are some other pictures of um, these flowers, which really are um, amazing. And here's the buds beginning to stick out of the um, uh, sides of the vine. And various scientists very happy to have discovered one of these. Uh, very difficult to find one of these, since they are very remote, and they don't last very long. So these are all people that consider themselves pretty lucky. And if we can get back to the PowerPoint. And then finally, um, 